shorts your eyes and pull like a dog. <laughs> and a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam Maguire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Star Sport Podcast. I'm Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. On today's show we'll be joined by the Racing Post's Ireland Editor Richie Forrestal to talk about the West Cork jockeys that made a big splash at last week's Cheltenham Festival. We'll also chat Limerick FC's Conor Ellis, who got himself on the score sheet in Limerick's 3-1 win against Cove, Cove Ramblers in the League of Ireland First Division on Friday night. But first, Kieran, it was another grim result for the Cork footballers mm. at the weekend. They were beaten by Donegal, having led by six points at half-time in Parky Rin. Kieran, where does this leave them with regards to the National Football League? It leaves them standing on the trap door with the trap door about to open on them, Jack. It's, it's pretty grim now at this stage. Um, I suppose let's get the mats out of the way. We're going into the final weekend of Division 2 of the National League this, this weekend. There was three teams on three points. You have Cork at the bottom, you have Clare and you have Tipperary. Two of those three are going down. That's 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 definite. What complicates this and what also helps, helps Cork is... That Clare and Tipperary are playing each other in in Turles, um this weekend, so that's actually a plus for Cork because Cork are away to Armagh and our Armagh team that are safe from from relegation, so Cork have to go and they have to beat Armagh. That's that, that that's that's the first thing. Look after number one. Look after the job. Win away to to Armagh. But then they Cork if they beat Armagh, they have to hope that Tipperary will beat Clare because if Tipperary beat Clare, that will relegate Clare. It will leave both Cork. And Tipperary on five points, provided they both obviously won. And then on a head-to-head um, record, Cork will stay up. But you, this is the state of play, Jack. We're here now, the last round of the league in, in Division 2. And Cork are relying on another result to try and keep them up. But first, they have to try and win against Armagh. Um, and, and the irony irony is, I was looking at, the, at Cork's league results last night in Division 2 of the league over the last two years. Of their seven home games they've played in Division 2, 2018 and 2019, Cork have won one. They've, they've actually picked up more points on the road. So if there's a glimmer of hope for Cork fans, is like they've, 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 they won away to Down last year. I think they, they won away to Mead, I think it was. They got a draw against Fermanagh away this year. They won away against Tipperary. So maybe there's something in it that this Cork team prefers playing away from Cork. So I think you're really clutching at straws there and hoping for the best possible outcome. Mm. Because when you look at how the game went on Saturday it's hard to be too optimistic they're playing in Parky Rin they're six points up at half time I think they only got five points then in the second half is there is there a problem with how the team performs in second half or it was was just a good strong Donegal performance in the second half I know Michael Murphy yeah. looked to be at his mm-hmm. level best and his level best is probably better than any of the current Cork footballers can offer so is, is that probably what turned the game I think you hit the nail in the head there with Michael Murphy he just he played very well I think he got was six or seven points he got got in the end and he was a big influence in the second half especially um, Cork had played with the wind I think in the first half too I'm right in saying so they were against the wind then they went down to the 14 men they got a red card and then they were chasing the game at the end and they said they left themselves very open at the back and a good team like Donegal just just picked them off then um, but it's just the end result Jack is we're looking at, at, at a Cork team at one win in their six Division 2 league games so far and like their bottom of Division 2 for a reason you know it is it's, 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 it's pretty grim and I think we've said in this podcast over the last couple of weeks that it could yet get worse and being relegated to Division 3 is is getting worse you know so kind of but all they can do now is go up to Armagh try and beat Armagh Armagh themselves have a very good home record so that's not an easy task but um, we've just got to hope that they can pull a performance out of somewhere they pull a performance out against Tip in Turles so now they have they have to do it again and just uh, before we move on from this it, when you look at how competitive Division 3 has become mm-hmm. if Cork go down there is no guarantees that they'll come straight back up it could be years because you're looking at a county like Derry, who went from Division One out to, to, to Division Four. I know Derry are now top of Division Four. They've they've four, they've six wins out of six, 
and they're going to come right back up again. But you're right, like there's some good teams. I think you've Westmead, you've Loud, you've a couple of Sligo, you've some some decent counties down inside in Division Three. So if Cork fall down there, like, like there, there is no guarantee. Yeah. You know, kind of there might be this line of thinking, oh, okay, let's say Cork get relegated down to Division Three, they'd win a couple of games down there, they'll bounce back up after winning a few games, have a bit of momentum, and that'll be a springboard yeah. to greater things. But that's that's been really gla- glass half full type of stuff there. I think sometimes the glass needs to be half full, otherwise you will give up altogether. I think so, yeah. Well, it was also a terrible weekend for the West Cork divisional sides in the Senior Football Championship, with Carberry losing to CIT and Beira getting well beaten by Shandoon. Over in Dunmanway, Kieran, this is not good for football in West Cork. No, 100% check, it's not. Um, and the way with the divisional and colleges set up in the Cork Senior Football Championship, there's no back door. So Carberry season is over. Bear season is over. Um, Carby have put in a lot of work um, this season under Tim Buckley, uh, the the manager. They've been training away since last November. Like he did a good job there, getting them all together. And then for them to fall at the first the first hurdle, and it's all over. It just seems so unfair, especially when you see clubs, clubs clubs get second chances. Sometimes they even get third chances. But there's, there's no back door. There's no kind of there's nothing for club for divisional sides to kind of fall back on. Like Carby did. They, they played well enough yesterday. It's actually a game against CIT that they might feel that got away. They, they lost by is it two points in the end, was yeah. it? Um, two points. And they actually, the Brian O'Driscoll got two goals yesterday. Kind of one in the first half very early on, one in the second half. It's it's a game they pulled themselves back into. The, like I said, Brian O'Driscoll, Colm O'Driscoll, Kevin O'Driscoll all played well. Um, Daniel O'Donovan from Kilmackaby got four points bef- before he went off. But I think what, what hurt... Um, I heard Carbon away is they're missing Rory Dean um, from Bantry Blues. Like Rory's a Cork senior, and I've said before, he was probably Cork's best performer last year. And Carbury need to get their best team out on the field to, to have any chance of progressing. For one reason or another, Rory was not part of the Carbury team this year. His loss was a big blow. When you look yesterday for CIT, Killian O'Hanlon, the Cork senior, had a massive game. And Rory is the sort of player who's capable of that for, for Carbury. So it's not stretching the imagination to say if Rory played against CIT on on Monday that um that Carberry could have won because he he is that good and he can he's a Cork senior after all so his loss was felt um but still they put in a huge effort kind of CIT had had a good run last year in, in the county championship good effort by Carberry but in the result their their season is over well we've had some. Down weeks with regards to Cork football since we've started this podcast. I think the one we've just had may well be the worst, but uh, hopefully the senior footballers can uh, can can get the job done away to Armagh this weekend. No, you've the glass half full, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try my best. Okay, well, we leave Cork football there for now. And coming up in part two, we'll be joined by the Racing Post's Richard Forrestal. Thank you for listening to the Star Sports Podcast. Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star featuring our award-winning sports section that has everything a sports fan in West Cork could want. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world. The Southern Star, number one for sport in West Cork. Now the Cheltenham Festival has become a global behemoth at this stage. But there was a strong West Cork flavour to proceedings last week, Aaron. Yeah, there certainly was, Jack. Um, Aidan Coleman won the stairs hurled with Paisley Park on the Wednesday, and then Castletown Kinnis, Noel Feely, a legend of, of the sport, won the Mayor's Novice Hurl on board 50 to 1 shot, Eglantine du Soil, on the Thursday. I made a dog's dinner of the pronunciation of that, but just forgive my accent. But uh, again, that was, that was a huge win for Noel, Jack. Yeah, and. Uh an especially huge win for him, considering the interview he gave to Racing TV shortly after, when he was extremely emotional and he hinted at retirement, a retirement that he has now confirmed will take place after racing this Saturday at Newbury over in the UK. We'll play a little bit of that interview now that he gave to Lily Hislop of Racing TV, and I have to say, it brought a tear to this eye as well. Uh... I've probably been thinking about it for a couple of weeks and I probably wasn't well for a while and uh, just, you know, as I saw it's time to let everyone else get on, the young lads get on with it. So, 
you'll be going at the top, Noel. You're, you, you've got a fantastic career. When, when, when are you? Go- I mean, when are you going to decide at the end of the season? Um, I suppose my age and Chris Broad, he's been brilliant, and my wife, my kids, and um, obviously, uh, I'll probably write, I, know, I haven't spoken to my trainers I write for, so it'll probably be I'll write for a couple of weeks or so, and then um, we'll, we'll play it by ear. But um, look, this this will be my last festival, anyway. And it's the winner that's prompted you to think that I want to say this out loud. No, no, I am. Um, obviously, I was hoping I'd get a winner here to, to, to you know to say it then, but. Um, it's a very hard place to get a winner, and you can't take it for granted. But um, I'm just delighted to write a winner for Charles Sullivan. He's been a great support sport for over the years, and it's just a perfect way to get a winner here for him. And um, I suppose announce it, and you know, it's time to, as I said, I'm not getting any younger, so it's time to get on with it. Nice way to end at the festival, nailing it on the line. Don't you think that that that'll yeah. be all right? You know, I won't forget it for a while anyway. So. <laughs> Look, I've had great support over the years. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I suppose I've got to start working now. So actually, it's been, it's been a fantastic time. Uh, look, I love riding horses. I love horses. Um, and I've had some great support over the years. And yeah, it's, it's, it's time to find that everyone else get on with it now, I think. I'm really shocked, um, but you know, I'm glad that you're retiring on your own terms, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. I'm, I think we're all going to miss you that, riding. That is, that is the important thing for me as well. Uh, Look, obviously, I wasn't very well there in, in January and February, and you know, if I couldn't have got back for the rest of the season, which probably was looking likely for a while, I'd have been very disappointed to go out and that sort of a way. Um, but to go out in the back of a winner is just really important. Yeah? Absolutely, I can understand that. No, we're going to massively miss you. Many congratulations on this festival winner. Well done. Thank you very much. Jack's just after wiping away his tears there with the tissue he's tucked into his pocket. But um, Jack, you caught up with the Racing Post Ireland editor Richie Forrestal earlier in the week to discuss last week. Let's hear from him now. OK, I'm delighted to be joined by Richie Forrestal, the Irish editor of the Racing Post, to chat about last week's events at Cheltenham and specifically the West Cork involvement over there. Richie, we'll start with Ina Shannon's Aidan Coleman, who won the Stairs Hurdle on board Paisley Park. For starters, can you maybe put into context how big a deal this is for our listeners who maybe don't follow racing religiously? Yeah, well, I don't think I'll, I'll need to tell anyone how big a deal Cheltenham is, Jack. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, the marquee event of the year from a National Hunt point of view. Um, but the, the, the race that um, Aidan won is the, is the Stairs Hurdle. We won the traditional four big races at the festival. You'd have the Gold Cup, the Champion Hurdle, the Champion Chase and the Stairs Hurdle. They're the long-standing four marquee races. So for him to win a big race like that, it was a real marquee day for him. Um, he's 30 years of age. You know, he's been over there for 12 years. A, a big race, a good horse, a very good horse is probably the one thing his career had lacked up to now. Um, he was unfortunate 10 years ago to miss out on a Grand National winner in Mon Mom when he chose something else in the race, won at 100 to 1 then without him. Um, and since then, he's struggled to find a good horse that could just elevate his career to the, to the next level. Uh, and that's what this fella is. Paisley Park is, is a very good horse and it's it's taking him into the next level now. Yeah, it was only his second ever grade one win. The first was also on board Paisley Park at Ascot in December. And as you mentioned, for a jockey who's been around the block for over a decade to finally have that grade one success with his horse and his first, his second Cheltenham success, he, he won there 10 years ago in the pretense. But it just shows that it's not all, it's not all glory and success for jockeys, even in the upper echelon? No, it's not. You have to work hard for it. You have to earn it. Um, you're entitled to nothing. And there's a lot of good riders there. I was looking at Leighton Aspel, who's over 40 years of age. He was riding when I was over there. He's never ridden a Cheltenham Festival winner. Um, and Aidan, you know, he was chipping away. He, he's ridden three or four centuries over there. He, you know, he, he's doing really well over there. Um, but it was the good horse that was just missing from his career. Uh, and, and he's got that now. Hopefully he'll be able to to build on it. He actually did ride. Um, he rode his first Cheltenham winner ten years ago, but he also rode another one in between that he unfortunately lost. He won on any any currency in the in the cross country race, um, and that horse sub- subsequently failed a, a, a drug test, so he lost one in the meantime. Um, but they're what you need. I mean, you know, we're going to be talking about Noel Feely in a minute, and, and similarly, Noel took an awful long time to get going. Um, you know, in terms of the high quality horses, Noel would have been riding over there a decade before he he came across a good horse. So it does take time. Um, but the other the other way of looking at it is that these days, you no, know, it was different when I was over there. Um, you know, coming to the end of my time over there, this kind of thing started off. But these days, the best jump jockeys seem to come of age thirty plus, like. 
you know, the likes of Adrian Maguire, Richard Dunwoody and all them, Norma Williamson, they were all packed up in their early 30s. These days, they seem to be 32, 33 upwards that, that these lads seem to get going. So Aidan, you know, he, he could still have a very bright future ahead of him in these big races if this, if this kick starts something for him. And there will be a lot of change over there now over the next few years. The likes of Ruby, the likes of Davy Russell, the likes of Dickie Johnson, Noel even, they're all going to be moving on. So there's going to be a, tra- a transition now in the upper echelons. Now, before we move on to Noel Feely and uh, just staying with Aidan for one more question. He gave a very emotional interview to the ITV cameras after his win in the Stair Circle. I don't know, maybe if you'd be able to give us any insight into what he was talking about in that interview. Yeah, that was to do with Campbell Gillies. I didn't actually see the ITV interview because I was there, but I spoke to him about it afterwards as well. Um, Campbell Gillies would have been one of his best buddies at the time, uh, and unfortunately, he was killed in a in a in a in a, a drowning accident when he was on holidays with a, a few other riders. Um, he rode a good winner in Brindisi Breeze at Cheltenham a few years ago, and within. I think it was within 12 months, both himself and the horse, um, the horse suffered a, a, an injury subsequently and died as well. They, they were both dead, so it was very sad. Um, and Aidan and himself were very close. Uh, when Campbell used to come down from the north of England, he used to stay with him. Um, so that hit, hit a lot of those lads hard at the time. Um, he was a, gr- a real kind of fun-loving, outgoing sort of guy, Campbell Gillies. Um, so that's what he was referring to, um, you know, and, and, and it was nice of him to, to note it on the day, I think. Absolutely. Well, on Thursday, Castletown Kenneman Noel Feely won the Mayor's Novices Hurdle with Eglantine Dusoy for Willie Mullins. He too gave an emotional interview, this time to Liddy Hislop on Racing TV, where he hinted at retirement. He has since confirmed that Saturday at Newbury will be his last day in the saddle. Tell us a bit about Noel and what he's meant to racing over the last 20 or so years. You obviously know him quite well. Yeah, I'd know Noel well. I'd know Noel for 25 years. Um, you know, we would have both been knocking around together over here as kids. They, he, he actually gave me my first winner in a pony race at Balavui, um, on Cora Lass himself and his brothers. Um, so I've known him a long, a long time. He, he's been a real um, a, a triumph for, you know, sticking with it and, and keeping the faith because, like, he's Noel is five years older than me. And, and I was over in England kind of two or three years before he... he eventually made the move over. He was very good in the pint of pints over here and he was slow to move. He's very kind of considered and meticulous in everything he does. And when he came over then he, he it took a couple of years to get going. Um he was with Charlie Mann for a long time. Now that was that was a very steady job, but Charlie Mann wouldn't have had um an awful lot of high class horses. He was riding a lot of winners. He was two champion conditional in two thousand and one. But again it was two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten before he really got going with a good horse. Um and he's just been, he's the closest thing I've seen in the last number of years to Ruby Walsh or Richard Dunwoody at, at his peak. He's a brilliant rider on a, a on a good horse in a top class race. He has so much composure. Um, he's such a steady pair of hands. Um, you know, he, he, he'll be a big loss to the wear room. Um, you know, he's a very popular lad over there. Doesn't get too high or low. He's, as I say, he's the most st- steady man you'll ever come across. But he's had a tremendous career. Um, he's won two King Georges on Sylvanaco Conti. He won two champion hurdles on um, Rock on Ruby and Bouvedere. He won a champion chase on Special Tiara. He's ridden nearly 30 grade one winners. And, and as I say, all of them pretty much in the last decade. Um, so he's going to be a big loss. Uh, you know, he, he's been... We like to think we, we produce some good good riders um, down around this part of the country, and he's up there with the very best of them. You'd be talking your normal Williamson's, Paul Tonand, obviously another Cork rider, won a, won a Gold Cup last week, Davy Russell, um, and he's right up there with the very best Irish riders that we've produced in the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah, so just in terms of that then, where does he rank among his generation of top Irish jockeys? Is he, would you consider him up there with the likes of Ruby Walsh, Davy Russell? Davy Russell, you mentioned Barry Garrity. He's in that bracket, isn't he? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. He rode three in in three or four years or four or five years. He rode um, centuries, which takes a bit of doing uh, over in England, you know, especially when McCoy was at his peak, um, and he, he did it then following on when, when Dickie was 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 at uh, you know top of the table as well. But he's bang up there. He 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 did challenge for a title once or twice, you know, but I mean, eventually he was kind of brushed off come come the spring. But it's it's in the big races that he really came into his own. When Ruby got injured um, a few years ago, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, it was to Noel the Paul Nichols turn for Masterminded, for Cato Starr, for Silviniaco Conti. That's how good a big race rider he was, and that was the, the area he really excelled in. 
Um, if you were look in the end, he kind of turned into a bit of a super sub. If you were looking for someone with a safe pair of hands who would who would be composed in the heat of the moment on the big day, Noel was the man they turned to. Even Nicky Henderson for Altior's first few chase starts, it was Noel who rode him in his first few chase starts. Um, he was a real kind of trustworthy, dependable guy. Um, and also worth remembering the, the injury problems he had over the years. You know, he broke wrists, he broke legs, he broke, um, he, he had trouble with his spine. Um, he, he, he had his appendix out recently and, and had complications furthering on from that. He had an awful lot of injury troubles and that also hindered him when he was trying to get going in the early years. Um, I mean, I, I remember counting it up years ago and he missed about two or three years through injury in, a, in an eight or nine year spell, which was an awful long time. And, and, and it's, it, it did slow his progress. Um, but in the end, look, he stuck with it. He had great faith in himself. Um, that was the one thing about Noel. He, he, was, he had a great belief in himself um, and his own ability and he stuck with it and he got the opportunities in the end. And when he got the opportunities, he had the, all the class in the world to take them. And you mentioned how composed he is and how much of a safe pair of hands he is. But when you saw his interview, or you may have not seen it at the time, but I don't know if you it saw did, it since, and he, he shed a tear. I don't yeah, know how, how did you got, feel about it. He got a bit of stick over that. I just sure to bring a tear to your eye, all right. I asked him if he, if he wanted a, a bottle or a dodo after it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it, it, he's been doing it for so long. I mean, he's been there since he went over in 98. Um, he'd previously been over to David Nicholson's The Dukes for the summer. Um, and he, he eventually moved over in 98. I was, I, I was in Lamborn at the time and um, Kevin O'Ryan was riding a lot of Charlie Mann's horses. He was riding bumper and hurdle horses and, and Kevin O'Ryan packed up. And I remember distinctly being on to Noel, pressing him, saying, look, you've got to give this a chance because you have a fella here. Kevin was, you know, riding bumpers and maiden hurdles and, and he rode 10 or 12 or 15 winners. And, you know, Noel would have been a far more experienced um, chase rider even at that stage. And eventually he... he um, he, he took the plunge and he came over in 98. So he's been at it for a long time. Um, he, he doesn't know anything else. You know, it, it's been his whole life. When you're when you're riding, you have to be devoted to it entirely. Um, and he has been that for the last 21 years. And he's been, he, he's an incredibly dedicated guy. Worth, worth remembering, um, and it wouldn't be very well known, that he was, along with, and even more so than McCoy, he was one of the first to, to bring the fitness levels up to a, a new level in terms of riding. Um, he took on a personal trainer at the beginning of the 2000s, that would have been unheard of um, back then. I mean, it, you know, it, it just wasn't done. And you see all the lads doing it now. They all have fitness regimes. Um, Noel was one of the very first to do that. And it's, it's, it's reaped dividends in the end because here he is. He's 43 years old. Um, and although physically, you know, it takes some time to recover from injuries. No, it takes him, it takes him that bit longer, but he's in great shape. And I mean, if it weren't for the injuries that come with the job, I should think he'd, he'd be fit enough to carry on for another couple of years. But it, it's got to the point where, you know, he was out at the beginning of the new year with his appendix. Um, and no matter what it is at this stage, if, if at this stage of his life, if he's injured, it just takes a bit longer to, to get over it. Um, and he's made the decision to, you know, to, to draw stumps. Um, so I think that's, that was part of the emotion. Like he's known nothing else. He's going to be facing it to a whole new regime from now on. Um, and I think we all just wish him well. He's, you know, he's an absolute gentleman. Um, and his family all over there in, in Castletown, Kenner, as you say, Mick and Joan, his parents, um, his two brothers, Michal and Eamon and, and, and Noreen and uh, Siobhan, his sisters. They're a great gang. They're all, um, they've all followed him thoroughly over the years. So we're all just glad to see him get out in one piece uh, and, and acknowledge the career he's had. Well, we wish him all the best of luck in his retirement. And as, as I said, he'll be hanging up his saddle and his boots after racing at Newbury on Saturday. Now, Richie, before we let you go, just a quick word on Dunmanway's Gavin Sheen. He rode a few, he he went close in a few races at Cheltenham last week. Um, okay, yeah. can you give us an update on him? Yeah, yeah, sure. Not from, not from, um, not far from Noel over there. Gavin is a good young rider. He's already ridden a, a stairs with Hurdle Winner, of course, and Cole Harden a few years ago. Um, and he's he, he's at the right age now to start pushing on as well himself and the likes of Aidan Coleman. In terms of the, the riders in England, Johnny Burke is another fella, another cork jockey um, who'd be there thereabouts over the next few years. There are going to be there's going to be a big change in the table over there over the next few years. There's a lot of those older lads are going to move on, um, and here for that matter as well. We saw Paul Townend riding the Gold Cup winner the other day. Um, we like to think there's a you know a good supply of uh, jockeys coming from this part of the country. And you, Davy Russell was another man with a Gold Cup winner a couple of years ago, um, trained by Jim Cullerton and Cork. So it's good to see Paul Paul kicking on as well. He's 28 years of age. Again, Ruby's not going to be around forever. 
Um, there's probably another couple of years in him, all right? He, you know, he's adamant he'll keep going for another couple of years. But Paul is there, um, tipping away, and and he takes his opportunities when he came. So they're, they're good young lads. Um, and as I said at the outset, there, it's uh, nowadays, it's the big national hunt jobs uh, are are for for lads in their thirties. Um, they they've had the experience. They you know they've been there and done it, and they know how to cope with the demands of the job. Um, you know, you look at someone like Brian Cooper who got the the Gigginstone job very young. Um, you know, and it's an awful lot for a young lad to deal with the pressures of jump racing at the highest level. Um, they're better off probably getting those jobs in their 30s. And, and the likes of Paul, Gavin Sheehan um, and, and Aidan Coleman, they're all going to be to the fore over the next few years. Great stuff. Well, Richie, Richie Forrestal of the Racing Post, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you for listening to the Star Sports Podcast. Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star featuring our award-winning sports section that has everything a sports fan in West Cork could want. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world. The Southern Star, number one for sport in West Cork. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast and Cale Kills' Connor Ellis has enjoyed a good start to life in the League of Ireland First division with promotion hopefuls Limerick bagging a goal in their 3-1 win versus Cove last Friday. Kieran, you spoke to Connor earlier on. How's he keeping? Uh, uh, Connor's in great form. He's a lot happier now. He got his first goal of the season. He'd missed a penalty in their 2-0 uh, defeat to Bray a couple of weeks before. And so to get his first goal of the season, and it was a beauty. It was a brilliant solo goal as well. It was just, It's just great for, for Connor's confidence. And as well as that, it was Limerick's first win of the season, so it pushes them up the table. I think they're they're up to sixth now, they're four points off shells in top spot. So all in all, it was a pretty good night for Connor, and he's he's just hoping Jack to kick on this year. He had his injury troubles last year, so it, it's a big season for Connor. Kind of, he's after getting a full preseason under his belt. He's over the hip injury that plagued him last year. So touch wood, there's lots of goals to come from Connor this season. Well, uh, let's hear some of that interview you did with Connor earlier today. We're joined now on the Star Sport podcast by Conor Ellis um, from, from Kekil, former Bantry Bay um, youth superstar who's now with Limerick in the in the first division. So first off, thanks for, thanks for coming on with us, Conor. Hope all is well. No problem. Thanks for having me. Nice to be uh, here. Uh, good stuff. First off, two reasons to celebrate over the weekend. You got off the mark with your first goal of the season and you helped Limerick to their, to their first league win of the season. So it's a win that moves you up to sixth. So two reasons to celebrate, two reasons to smile. Yeah, definitely. I suppose you know, it's only the fourth game of the season and I had a slight knock last week, so I didn't play against Strada. So technically it was only my third game. So it wasn't kind of panic, but still it's nice to get off the mark early. You know, it's kind of a monkey off the back almost. So, and to win as well was a bonus. For yourself, Cotter, to, to get off the mark with that first goal of the season, how important was that for you? Massive, you know, I suppose last year with the injuries and probably my own personal performance and the team side of play, it wasn't the best year. I'd be the first to hold my hands up and say, so this is a massive year for me. You know, I know people say you're young or whatever, but still, I'm 21 now. I suppose it's time to be putting in the performances and showing that I can do it on the bigger stages. So I suppose the unfortunate thing for a striker is you could be brilliant and you could set up a lot of chances and you could come off thinking you have a great game but at the end of the season you're going to be marked on the goals you score so you know to get off the mark early was important for me for a confidence point of view as well because strikers feed off confidence so like like i know there was a penalty miss against Bray a couple of weeks ago for you so to get that first goal it's so important for you like you just want to kick on from here because like you just want to score goals connor 100 percent. you know i think obviously Everything is important as a striker, but ultimately that's what that's what people look at. They say, how many games has he played? How many goals has he scored? You know, and it it is massive for yourself. Like I scored in the first half, and even in the second half the other night, I felt so much confidence. You know, I was on the ball, I was running at them. I, I felt the goal brought my performance up two or three levels then for the rest of the game. So it's hopefully long may it continue. And what a way to score your first goal! It was, it was a fine solo effort. Yeah, it you was. Know, they took the corner and Robbie headed out and I kind of said a gamble and left my man in, in the box which was a bit risky I said a gamble I'm trying to get there and I just beat the defender to it and kind of took off from there so it wasn't bad yeah it was one of my better goals oh, Good stuff let's take a quick rewind back to last season so you just moved to deliver a couple of games in and, and you, you felt your hip at you like kind of, and that kind of curtailed the season as well but didn't, didn't it? 
Yeah, massively, you know. Um, it was it was quite an unusual injury, really. It was a hip impingement. So what it was was the specialist said, whatever way, when I was younger, the bones didn't quite grow into the socket properly. So it was grinding against it. But the pain was shooting into my groin. Yeah. You know, for the first month, I took a month off because the physio thought it was a groin strain. So I took a month to do the rehab for a groin injury. And I came back and the first game broke down again. So that was massively frustrating because I took a month off and I was treating a completely separate injury. You know, there was nothing wrong with my groin. So that's yeah. when I went down the specialist route. And then I had to take the three months out. So all in all, it was four months out of a seven and a half month season. So it was the bones of over half a year. So it was frustrating, especially. Like, especially since it was your first season at Limerick and you were probably keen, keen to make an impact, keen to make a presence felt what you know? Exactly, Joe. I suppose the year before Cork was great, we won the double, but I was only coming off the bench every week. So I was itching to get going. The first trip or weeks before it, I was playing and I felt I was doing well. And not only, I suppose, the new, the new club was important, but Touchwood, all through my underage, all through, you know, even in Gaelic football and soccer, I'd never had any injury at all, not even so much as a couple of weeks out. So to go from nothing at all to a four-month injury was tough mentally, you know, to, to just to, so... And how long did it take you to actually get over the injury then? Because I remember we were talking a few weeks back and you were saying you got through the pre-season and touch wood again, like, you know, like there, there, was, there, was no, there was no knocks, there was no nothing. Did it take you a while to kind of to get that injury out of your head? It did, you know, because I suppose I missed from the start of April and then I came back in July, I think. So obviously the team was down the bottom. So the manager kind of rushed me straight back in, which to be fair was my own decision too. But <laughs> so then the last 10, 12 games I played on the back of four months out. So you know, it took me three or four games at least to get my match fitness, my sharpness. And then by the time I was actually feeling myself again, there was four or five games left in the year. So it nearly rolled off the whole season for me, being honest. With that good pre-season under your belt, so do you hope that this is the season where Limerick fans will see the best of Conor Ellis? Definitely. I think I have a lot to prove this year, I suppose. A few people kind of looked at me and said, geez, maybe he's not as good as they thought he was. But, I think it was because I was playing within myself. Even it was nice the other night, you know, I felt fully fit. We went two up front for the first time, which is what I'd be used to all through my underage at Cork. And straight away after the game, now granted it's only one game, but a lot of people were saying, oh, geez, maybe he does need someone with him more. You know, you can see a difference. So it's good. And that takes my confidence on our level as well, that people can finally see the player that I know I am. But obviously, I have to do it a lot more than just one weekend. I have to do it over the next six, seven months consistently. Do you prefer playing with a partner up front? I do. I think, I suppose, I mean, the first thing that the weakest part of my game is the physical aspect. You know, I'm not a big, strong centre forward that's going to pin a defender or win a header. So I think I had Kieran O'Hanlon up there the other night, who was a very big, strong lad. So it allowed me to drop in and get on the ball and you know, run at people. And I think it gave me the freedom then to go where I wanted, which I've been used to in all the underage teams. So it was good. And you, you'll be hopeful too the fact that like Limerick now touch wood again all going well you'd be challenged for promotion this year compared to last season when you're batting relegation so but like you should see more of the ball this year which which should in turn create more chances for you up front. That's it you know we should we should have the ball in in the better half I think we scored three the other night I don't think we scored three all season last year so yeah. that alone is a positive and also even just for around the place you know training now the last couple of days everyone's been a lot happier after a win whereas last year you know we were going on five six seven game defeats in a row and everyone gets very negative and so it's just nicer it's a better atmosphere around the place and that's going to make us play better as well so it's good because i was going to ask you connor what is the mood in the club like now obviously things didn't go too well last season but kind of like you started off the season in, in, in a positive frame even off the field there was kind of um, financial backing before the start of the season now you got yeah. your first win you're only four points off the top you know kind of what is the mood around the club at the moment it's good you know I think I suppose everyone was a bit airy in pre-season the supporters especially as to what the season would bring because no one wants to get relegated and then go from being a premier club to right down the bottom of division one you know so yeah. I think the first the first game we played Longford and Longford were touted as one of the top two or three to win the league. So and I think it was nil all. And to be honest, we probably had the better of the game that night. So I think from the first night, because we got off to a good start, the supporters have quickly said, right, this is a young team with a bit of potential. So they've got behind us. And to be fair, they've been very good. And the whole city seems to be more positive about Limerick again. And I suppose after the win the other night, that was, that was massive now that hopefully we can continue it for the next few weeks. 
Can we TD this weekend, is it? Yeah, yeah, on Saturday. And I see they're, they're fourth in the table, so again, it, it's a chance to kind of just make up a bit, a bit of ground and close up with the leaders as well. That's it, you know, I think, especially in the Irish football, the game's come taken fast, so you can put together three or four wins and you fly at the table. I look at two games in, everyone was saying there was a crisis at Cork City, and now I think they're three or four points off top of the league, so yeah. there sometimes it can be a bit fickle and people can get the wrong impression, but I think we played the top three the first three games, and I think come the end of the first series of games, we'll look at them a couple of points as good points rather than we should have won. So if we can, if we can string together a few wins now, it will look a lot better for us. Here is what's here at the Southern Star. You've been someone who's been around for the last couple of years and we, we almost lose factor. You're only 21 still, you know, you're a former West Cork youth sports star. You won the double with Cork City, you know, whatever, but you're still only 21. So you must feel yourself like you, you like there's loads of improvement, like there's a lot more to come from you over the next couple of years. Definitely, you know, sometimes I think I have to think that myself because because I broke onto the scene quite young and because I went to Cove on loan rather than staying under 19, I think this is my fourth season in senior football already at 21, so sometimes I do think I put a bit too much pressure on myself that I should be further along in my development or I should be doing better than I am, but then I suppose I have to look too, I'm 21 and I missed the bones of a year last year with an injury, so there's still a long time left in my career, you know, so... I just have to keep working hard. And you've already packed the load in, like I said, to double with Cork City, then the opposite end of the spectrum, being relegated with Limerick last year. So you've, you've seen the highs and lows of, of, of soccer at the top level over the last couple of years, which will probably help your development too. Definitely. I think it's made me hunger, to be honest, I suppose. <laughs> you know, when I was coming to Limerick, I put the work in in the off-season and I was really looking forward to it. But at Cork, I almost... I wouldn't say I took it for granted, but you know, you're in, you come from winning everything under 19 to a senior team that's winning everything. You think, geez, professional football is great. Everyone always says it's cutthroat, but it's brilliant. You know, we're, we win everything. So to go from that and then to come and get relegated, you know, it's made me hunger to go back to the high days and the glory days because you know, that double I won might be the only thing I win all my career. Who knows? So I think it's just taught me to appreciate the good days and work harder to make sure they're more consistent. And it's fantastic too because. Like we have a lot of, of young local West Cork soccer players now who go play Cork City under 13s and under 15s, and with Denzel Fernandez with Cove and Ronan Hurley with um, with Cork City now. But you were the first yeah. to that you were the first to that brigade, and it, it does show Connor that there is a path from West Cork up to the top levels, which is important. A hundred percent, you know, and I think the under 13 league is brilliant now because it allows lads to get in and get the development in younger. But all of them lads, there's no reason why they can't go on to the next level now. I suppose, although I was the first one to play senior, I still looked up to Steve McCarthy and Conor O'Driscoll growing up. They were in the under-19 teams and the Irish squads, and they did it all before me. Granted, they didn't quite make it to the top, mm-hmm. but, you know, it's good to have a role model, and sure, they might look at me as a role model, but I look at people across the water that are 50,000 times better than me, as, you know what I mean? So I just think everyone should be working hard, and you're never going to be the finished article no matter what, so... Do you set yourself? Do you set yourself a target for the season? A kind of kind of a goal target? Are you looking to hit double figures, or is that something you keep private, Connor? Um, not really. You know, I suppose you take it game by game. You don't want to be arrogant and sit here and say, right, I'm going to score X amount of goals and we're going to be the best team. But to be honest, from a team that's just been in the Premier Division, we should be finishing minimum fourth and getting yeah. into the playoffs. And like that's a realistic game and. As a centre forward, I should be hitting 10 goals. If I want to be back playing in the Premier next year or kicking on, I should be hitting 10 goals. Touch wood if I have an injury free season. So. And who are the biggest challengers so far for Limerick this year? Uh, Shelburne, I suppose, are the big ones on paper. You know, I think mm-hmm. they signed Colin Kilduff and Conan Byrne, who are two Premier Division players, really. You know, Kilduff was at Dundalk a year or two, Conan Byrne was at Pats. But, you know, you never know. Like we had the two wingers, Will and Carol, that played either side of me all last season. We're both in the under twenty one home base, so I yeah. think we have a lot of potential there. And we were all young lads. Granted, we're young, but there's a lot of good players. If it clicks and we get a bit of confidence and get three or four wins, we could beat anyone in the division on our day. Oh, fantastic! Good news stuff. Clear, Connor. Thanks so much for joining us, and um, congratulations again on the goal last, last week. Yeah. Hopefully, there's a lot more to come, and I'm convinced there will be a lot more to come. So, we'll check in with you again as the season goes on, Connor. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you for listening to the Star Sports Podcast. Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star featuring our award winning sports section. 
that has everything a sports van in West Cork could want. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world. The Southern Star, number one for sport in West Cork. Now, Kieran, it was a bank holiday weekend last weekend, Patrick's Day and all that. So I can only assume that we are in for an action-packed, as Buff Egan Snapchat Supremo would say, iconic sports section this Thursday. I think Buff would even struggle to get a word to kind of to describe how good this week's sports section is, Jack, to be quite honest. Um, I'm going to say it again, Jack, but it's a cracker, Jack. It's an absolute <laughs> cracker. Um, it was a... Fantastic week weekend for sport in terms of action last weekend. The results weren't great, but still we have we have to cover it. So we have another plenty um I suppose West Cork Rally, I'm gonna to go to first. The West Cork Rally was on in Clonakilty last weekend. Craig Breen won the overall, but there was a lot of local success for some of the West Cork locals here. Um David Guest from Dunmanway won the national title, I think I could be wrong on that. But he finished, or he might have finished third one or the other, but he, he was the best West top Cork. Local. Top Yeah, the top local, and he won the the top West Cork driver award. And there was plenty more local success besides that. So we have a two-page special on the, the West Cork rally. I and think just on that, before you move on, I think someone like Craig Breen winning that, even though he's not a local, it actually adds to it, because he's the best driver there. Yeah. So you want your best the best to win because he's there taking it seriously it's like when Tiger Woods used to come to play in the the World Golf Championships in Ireland even though there was Irish golfers in the field it's better for the worldwide that is 100% because more people watch when Tiger wins and so more rally fans around the world will have been keeping track because when they see Craig Breen at the top of the leaderboard so I think that was good for the event and uh, yeah as major success overall yeah and as well as that um, Hervin and the the Finnish driver four time runner up in the World Rally Championship We've kind of an interview with him in this week's Star, and he said it was his best ever rally experience. So when you have someone of his caliber who's done what he's done on the world stage to come along and praise the West Cork Rally in such effusive terms, the best the best rally he's ever he's ever done, the most fun he's ever had in a rally. He couldn't praise the fans around here enough. He couldn't praise Clan of Kilty and the organisers enough. Like that's gold, Jack. You know. And to show how popular the West Cork Rally was in West Cork over the weekend just a, a bit of data analytics for our listeners out there our most read story on southernstar.ie last week was a west cork rally related story and it was craig breen talking about how impressed he was by the setup of the course so the interest was obviously there and it's great to see the rally going from strength to strength because i know we're going to stray from sport into tourism but uh, like this podcast covers everything but but um just to boost that that the exposure that having the, the West Cork Rally, which was a part of the British Rally Championship this year, the boost that will give this local area, Clan of Kilty and all, and all the surrounds, because it was opening up um, this beautiful, beautiful part of the country to maybe thousands of people, or hundreds of thousands, hopefully in TV audience, that would have never seen West Cork before. So hopefully kind of there will be a knock-on effect in the in the weeks, months and years to come. You know, So that's, that, that's the hope. Yeah, absolutely. Turning back then to the sports section, there was two Beamish Cup semi-finals on the weekend just gone. So we are looking forward to Adrena Rangers and Togar Celtic final in a couple of weeks. Both games went to extra time. They weren't full of goals, but um, the big thing is Drina, the Vinden champions, are back in it again. They are still in the hunt f- for the league title. So they are they are the team to, to beat again. And they are, as we all know, the reigning West Cork Sports Team of the Year. So and we might preview that final uh, closer to the time as well, Kieran, will we? A hundred percent. It's it's the Beamish Cup final is the is like the FA Cup final here in West Cork, but it's it's never lost its its prestige. Like the FA Cup final has been watered down, you could say, especially since Man United lost to Wolves the weekend. But <laughs> let's not mention the the war. But um, the, Ollie's at the wheel. Ollie's at the wheel. But I still careering into the ditch. <laughs> but um. But the, the Beamish Cup final, yeah, a couple of weeks' time, we'll definitely do a special on that, Jack. It's um, not, it's, it's huge, huge local news. We also have an interview with Clan of and Cork uh, football goalkeeper Mark White this week. Mark picked up uh, Celtic Ross West Cork Sports Star February monthly award on uh, last last week for his role in UCC Sigerson Cup win. So I sat down with Mark and had a, had, I had a good chat with him just about life as a goalkeeper, why he's a goalkeeper in the first place, and. For, he's, he used to play outfield for a while but his outfield days are finished so Mark talked openly about that so he's and he's only 
he's only 21 I think he is so he's a he's another fella for the future so there's absolutely loads in there if someone's looking for anything to do on Thursday Friday and Saturday just pick up this week's Southern Star Sports section and you will spend the best five six hours of your life guaranteed and don't forget if you can't make it to one of the wonderful West Cork news agents you can always just log on to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e-paper and it costs less than the one that you buy in shop it's less than two euro per week when you sign up annually less than two euro per week and you get all this good stuff so get on that's value for money that's yeah. that's another cracker jack isn't it that is another cracker and that offer is not just one special offer that is always when you buy the paper online it's available for less than two euro a week I can't, can't do much oh, more it just that. makes so much sense you know just like, what, what's, the, what's the address again to get that www.southernstar.ie forward slash e paper but of course buy the print edition as well because you still can't beat buying the paper can you no I love the feel of a paper in my hands I do myself um, and again if anyone's out there wants to send us any questions in email them to sport at southernstar.ie we only had one question this week from a reader and he wanted to know how tall Kieran McCarthy is I am six foot two and three quarters on a good day and if I've heels I'm six foot four <laughs> so there you have it six foot four in heels that's all we really needed to know but and I'm a good foot taller than Jack <laughs> who's actually taller sitting on the stool than he is standing up <laughs> I don't know about that but uh, yeah keep your keep your questions coming in so um, thanks very much for joining us again we'll be back next week at the same time so make sure to rate review and subscribe on iTunes Android Spotify YouTube Stitcher or anywhere else where you listen to the show Thanks very much.